Let's go. The first time I ever went abroad, went to an airport, went on a plane, was when I went to Bangladesh for family holiday. Now, this plane was a fairly quiet plane. But when I landed in Bangladesh, I instantly realized that the arrival area was packed full of people. I'm talking hundreds of people. <laughs> Why are there so many people here for this one quiet plane? I then come to realize that this entire airport section were just my cousins that come to pick us up. And I'm like, why? This made no sense to me. White people have one driver that comes to pick them up with a sign. With Asians, our entire village turns up. And I'm like, why are so many of you lot here? We're all going to the same house afterwards. And guess who has to pay for all their taxi rides? My dad! What? It's fine. You get to know them. You chill with them. They're nice people, right? And uh, once I learned all their names, I realized that there's different types of cousins, right? Like, you firstly have the go-to cousin. This cousin is the plug. He's got links, he's got connections. He will hook you up with whatever essentials you need as a Westerner. Hollywood films, junk food, British chocolates. He once even took me to a barber that could carve patterns into my beard. I'm like, bro, we don't even have this type of service in England. He's like, brother, I got you, you know? Then we have the cousin, who you think is your uncle, but he's actually your eldest cousin. He's like too young to be old and too old to be young. He's a weird combination of dad jokes and TikTok references. You don't know what kind of banter you can get away with him, so it's always a bit orcs. But then my least favorite cousin, the staring cousin. Oh my God. This guy has not stopped looking at you since the moment you landed. Literally, he has not blinked once. Eventually, you have to tell your go-to cousin to get rid of your staring cousin. It's that bad. But, you know, like, thinking about Bangladesh now, it makes me emotional, you know, because you miss it. You miss it. When you're not there, you miss it. And I remember the last day, it's super emotional. Full on Bollywood film. And they're crying, I'm crying. I miss it. I miss it, man. The food, the smells, the vibe. Come to think of it, I even miss my staring cousin. I'm absolutely in awe of people who can book last minute holidays. Because growing up, that was not the case in our family. Our holiday planning took a whole year. It would start with my mum telling me to go through Teletext to look for cheap flights. I'm showing my age now. And then after about a month of this, she would decide that she doesn't trust Teletext anymore. She wants to see a real person. So then we'd go into town and we'd go and see the two Indian travel agents that she likes. And then she'd spend weeks pitting them against each other. And then when she'd finally settled on one, she would then negotiate with them by just staring at them until they gave her the right price. And then we'd start our India adventure by going to the embassy and getting our visas. Now, this is a wonderful insight into Indian bureaucracy because there is no system there. It's absolute chaos. Time has no meaning and no one's ever heard of customer service. See, nowadays when I see mums packing stuff to go away, you know, they'll pack their children's favourite snacks, they'll get those, you know, little mini boxes of raisins or little rice cakes. Not my mum, no, no, she didn't pack anything for me, but what she did pack was the MS cardigans that she's been stockpiling for years that she's going to go and gift to people that she hates. <laughs> now, we as a family are notoriously late for everything. So, weddings, an hour late, parents' evening, half an hour late, but airport, four and a half hours early, because now my dad's in charge. And it's his job when we go to the airport to look at all the airport staff and see which one is the most likely to let our overpatched suitcases go through so we don't have to pay. Let me tell you, there is nothing more embarrassing as a 14-year-old than having to drag your suitcase to one side and then put on 15 M&S cardigans over your clothes. Now, I really loved going to Pakistan and Bangladesh as a kid. I used to go there every single year. And one thing I learned very quickly about being Bangladeshi, in fact, just being Asian, right, is all Asian people are master genealogists, right? This is how I knew this. My mum would introduce me to someone I'd never met before, and it would be the most convoluted introduction I've ever seen. She'd be like, this, this is your auntie's cousin's ex-wife's niece's sister's husband. And I'd be like, OK, so a friend of the family then. And she'd be like, yes, but you can call him uncle. Like, OK, thanks, Mum. That's impossible, right? 
I love everything about going to Bangladesh. Right. The only thing I really hated was going to markets because three things would invariably happen. The first is that, look, I don't want to shock you, but I was quite a tubby kid. I'm nothing if not consistent, right? Quite a tubby kid. Every time I went to the market, the market stall owners would take it upon themselves to start squeezing my hands, squeezing my legs. I guess they'd never seen anyone this well fed before, right? So they kept squeezing me and they'd ply me with fizzy drinks, left, right and centre, loads of fizzy drinks. I'd take them, I'd drink them, be wired for hours, but unbeknownst to me, they'd be charging my mum for those fizzy drinks. So cue robust discipline from my mum. <laughs> now, I speak Bengali, fluent Bengali, also Urdu, Hindi and Punjabi. You're welcome, yeah, multilingual. But whenever I got excited in the market, because I'd see like fruits, vegetables, toys, or I'm like, didn't care about the fruits and vegetables, just the toys, right? I get super excited and I'd express my excitement in English. I'm like, oh, mummy, mummy, these things are wonderful. Look at this, I'd like to buy this, please. As soon as the market stall owners heard my accent, whatever my mum was bartering on, they'd just ramp up the prices immediately. Cue robust discipline from my mum. The third thing that would happen is my mum would wake me up of a morning and be like, Ishan, come on, get up, we have to go, there's loads of traffic, let's go to the market. Before I even had time to register that my mum has just asked me to go out to the market with her, cue robust discipline from my mum, because you know, just in case. When you come back from India, you bring fake t-shirts, Indian clothes you're never going to wear again, and a guaranteed dodgy stomach. But what you don't want to bring back is something far more serious, like hepatitis C. So I hope you've enjoyed this, but please pay attention to the next bit. If you or your family have ever lived in or regularly travelled to Pakistan, India or Bangladesh and had medical, dental or cosmetic treatment, you may be at higher risk of Hepatitis C. The good news is, Hepatitis C can be treated. For more information, visit hepc.co.uk and speak to your GP. Not me, I'm not your GP. <laughs> <laughs>